been talking throughout the week about the fact that you can see already the effects that climate change is having around the world. And we are now gonna be joined by an author who has witnessed firsthand many of those effects. This is Dar Jamail, author of The End of Ice, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption. Welcome to the show. Good to be with you, John, thank you. Very glad to have you here. So your book is very unique in the research you did before writing it. Can you Can you tell us about that? I made it a point to go to as many places around the world as I could that were really experiencing the, the, the most dramatic and fastest impacts of runaway climate change. So places like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, the Amazon rainforest, glaciers up in Alaska, glaciers in Glacier National Park, and of course, South Florida for sea level rise to really try to bring to the reader really kind of the emotional, visceral experience uh, that one gets by going to these places since so many people uh, really aren't able to get out to the Amazon on the weekend or something <laughs> like that. So really, to, and then go there with scientists to kind of back up what I was seeing with the the latest and most current science and, and also to give people an idea, of, uh, an idea of where things are going. So I have a feeling that you probably had at least some expectation of what you might see, but uh, were you surprised by uh, the extent of the, the changes or the damage that you witnessed in any of these cases? Very much so, yeah, I had done years of research to figure out which places to go to when and with whom and had a pretty good idea what I thought I was going to expect to see. And while I, I did see the evidence of what I had researched, being there in person and really seeing it with your own eyes and feeling it in your body. For example, it's one thing to read about the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef and it's quite another to be snorkeling in the water 10 feet above coral that's completely bleached out and on its way to dying. I mean, you get a really visceral experience in your body. And I think that's very important for people to understand. When we talk about climate change and we throw around all these different statistics and future projections, it's easy to lose sight of what it really feels like to be around a whole ecosystem that's literally dying. So uh, I, I was reading an interview that, that you conducted uh, about this book and uh, there was a very interesting uh, quote, something you said. You said that uh, a choice between hope versus hopelessness in the face of climate change is a false choice. Can you explain what you meant there? I do, and I think a lot of us get kind of caught up in this paradigm of that that is our choice. You either have to be hopeful that somehow we're gonna figure out a way to mitigate this or or it's absolutely hopeless, let's throw our hands in the air if we're off the cliff, what's the point in doing anything? And I think what, what it really comes down to is uh, we have a moral obligation to do everything that we can to take care of the parts of the planet that are still intact and do everything that we can to mitigate and adapt to what's happening regardless of the outcome because we, we really can't com control the outcome. And I think hope is kind of an expectation that if I do X, I'm gonna get Y. And, and at this point, with because things are so far advanced with runaway climate change, that's a setup for failure and depression and despondency. And so I think it's really, more important to stay focused on this is what I can do right now today in this place. And, and I'm morally obliged to the planet to trying to be a good steward of that as well as to future generations to do my best to fulfill that moral obligation. So in your explorations for the writing of this book, you did work in the US but also in, in areas around the world. As you were doing that, did you see any examples of either individual politicians or countries who, who do seem to actually understand the urgency with which we need to deal with this, that, it, that is addressing it in a way that you think is actually commensurate with the extent of the, the, the threat? I, I have not yet run into a politician anywhere or a country that is behaving exactly as you described. Because the urgency of the crisis and how fast it's going and what is staring us in the face that's coming at us very, very quickly, there's really, I haven't found anyone that's responding accordingly. I mean, it, it, to use the, it's a bit of a worn out analogy, but if a meteor is coming to the planet, how are we gonna respond if we still have a chance to maybe do something to kind of mitigate the impacts and make them somewhat less worse. And I haven't seen anyone anywhere behaving in kind. I mean, I think the closest thing we probably have in the United States would be AOC and pushing the new Green Deal. And that's fantastic. And I'm fully supportive of this action in the right direction. But even that is still, uh, I think, not anywhere near the immediacy that the, the, in the sense of urgency that this crisis is calling from us right now. 
Okay, well, let's end on that slightly depressing note. But <laughs> thank you, Dar, for joining us. We really do appreciate it. And the book is The End of Ice, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption. Very interesting case studies and examples of what's really going on already around the world. And so I recommend our, our viewers check it out. Thank you again. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for watching this clip from The Damage Report. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell on YouTube to get notifications of our new videos. And of course, you can catch the full Damage Report live every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on TYT Network on YouTube TV.